Hey everybody, I'm Lisa Evers, full-time investigative journalist for Fox 5 News in New York, and also host of Street Soldiers, which you see on Fox 5, which you see on YouTube, uh, Fox Soul, and also here on Hot 97, iTunes, Spotify, all over the place. We have been getting so many questions about this Sue Surf case that I wanted to bring in a top criminal defense attorney who has tried federal cases to bring it all together for us and help us really understand what's going on and what has happened. It was one week ago today, today being October 20th, 2022, that Sue Surf, his government name is Rajan Cox, was taken into custody by a U.S. Marshal's Fugitive Task Force, the regional New York, New Jersey Fugitive Task Force, and charged in a federal indictment in a RICO case. So Phil's going to break this down to us. I have a bunch of different questions for him, too, and we'll see if we can understand what's really going on. So, Phil, thank you so much for, for sharing your time and your expertise uh, with us on this, on this particular case. Lisa, absolutely. Thanks for having me. So first of all, let's start at the beginning. The federal grand jury indicted him on September 22nd. That indictment was sealed for a couple of weeks. What does that actually mean? Is that typical? Very typical. Typically what's happening, Lisa, is the government is still continuing ongoing investigations. When you're dealing with these multi-defendant indictments, just because you have a certain set of names on any particular indictment, there's usually and often a lot of names that are not yet on that indictment and that are still being investigated. So at times the government doesn't want to bring a lot of attention to the fact that maybe some criminal acts that one person was involved in could give rise to the second person saying, oh, if the first person has been arrested, it may be time for me to flee. So what the government will do in order to not have to deal with that is keep a lot of these indictments sealed such that when they're secret, people don't necessarily know that law enforcement may be looking for them. Now, when I looked at the paperwork, it says that it, it is a superseding indictment. What is a superseding indictment? Is that different from a regular one? And what does that mean? A superseding indictment typically is an indictment that just contains more information either than an original indictment, or at times there may be an information that initially the pleadings were moving forward with, or there may just be a complaint. And so when you have a superseding indictment, there is typically much more information substantiating the charges, and it can come at any point in the case prior to the commencement of trial. So was it conceivable that they could be adding more charges to Sue Surf or to any of the other defendants at any time as this investigation continues? It's certainly conceivable because going back to our first point, there may be a situation where someone is arrested subsequent to this particular indictment that provides information and gives the government more cause and reason to believe that other crimes have been committed. And what the government does not have to do is wait until some further date or some further trial to bring charges. They can simply add those charges to this instant indictment by essentially filing another superseding indictment and proceeding forward on the additional charges. Phil, and we hear the term, this is a RICO case, but we hear RICO, racketeering, conspiracy, all kind of used interchangeably. Are they all the same? In one respect, they are very much so for related. For us late people that don't understand the law the way you do. <laughs> no, absolutely. You know, in many respects, they're very related. And I mean, we can say in many respects, they are either siblings or at least first cousins because these charges are so often very much so brought together. So when we talk RICO, what we're really discussing is the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. This was an act that Congress passed in the 70s as a means primarily to be able to infiltrate the mob and moreover, get higher within the hierarchy to be able to bring down the bosses because so often they were shielded from a lot of the criminal activity at the bottom. And so although the initial purpose of RICO was in many respects to go after the mob, it in many respects covers all different kinds of criminal organizations or enterprises, whether it's MS-13, whether it's the Bloods, whether it's the Crips, you name it. It could be a corporate entity that is involved in illicit activity. It just gives the government a lot more leeway to freeze assets. It gives the government a lot more leeway to connect people that may otherwise not be a part of a lot of the lower rung criminal activity and allows them to still, even to this day, get to a lot of the bosses of these organizations. Now, as the founding partner of, of a premier Wall Street law firm, which happens to be black owned, you've tried these cases, you've won some cases against the federal government, and you've also represented hip hop artists and rappers in the past. How serious is this case in particular against Sue Surf and overall? 
These charges are very serious. And frankly, anytime that you're dealing with any type of indictment in federal court, it's going to be serious because the feds, as opposed to a lot of state level authorities, will typically be patient and wait three, four, five, six years. I've seen them wait up to 10 years at times to bring charges because they want to make sure that before they are utilizing the just behemoth amounts of resources that they come with to prosecute a case, that they're doing so in a way that is worth it and will that will ultimately gain a conviction. So they will take their time. And in this respect, when you are dealing with these charges, they're always going to be very serious, particularly with the prison exposure, particularly with just the, at times, lack of ability to mitigate against that which they have been able to find in a crew over the last five to 10 years. And so when you look at the ones, when they name the individual defendants, because talk about the, to, with us uh, about Rajan Cox to uh, Sue Surf, it looks like there's only a couple of charges that, that he has. Can he also be held guilty of other charges in that, in, that are named in the indictment of the other defendants or any others in the future? Well, I mean, just to start, even if we were just to isolate the couple of charges that Sue Surf has been charged with, those are very serious charges in and of themselves, whether it was at the federal level or the state level. He's alleged to have shot a rival gang member. He's alleged to have coordinated a drug deal uh, via actually Instagram of all places. And moreover, he has a prior felony conviction. He's charged with having possessed a firearm, which becomes a federal offense when you have a prior felony conviction and you possess a firearm that was manufactured across state lines. And in New York and New Jersey, the guns typically that are found here were not manufactured here. So they fall under federal jurisdiction. So those charges just separately and apart would be serious enough. But when you then combine them with those acts being alleged to have been a part of a grander overall criminal enterprise, it really, what it really does is it ups the sentencing exposure. I mean, we're talking about an individual right now who's facing, you know, at least 20 years. That's just talking about on the racketeering counts. And then if we start to talk about consecutive time with respect to the drug deal, with respect to the shooting, with respect to being a felon in possession, this is a lot of time, Lisa. So he's conceivably looking at, at the minimum, if found guilty, 20 years, and then he could conceivably end up spending the rest of his life behind bars. 20 years, I can tell you, is certainly a number that's resounding in his head right now, depending on how you go in, if you decide to plea bargain, if certain counts are dismissed at a certain time, you can never at the inception have a full understanding of what the sentencing exposure may be. You just look at what the charges and sentencing exposure are in terms of the indictment that you're dealing with. And with respect to the indictment that Sue Surf is dealing with, 20 years is certainly a number that is probably in his head and one that's causing him most likely a lot of anxiety. Now, in terms of the other defendants, there's there's 10 defendants on that particular indictment. Does he, uh, do, what typically happens when you have a multi-defendant indictment like that or case like that where there's so many, so many people being charged with a variety of different things in these alleged conspiracies? I mean, you have a lot going on. There's, a, a, let's just start with the fact that there's going to be a lot of discovery. Discovery being just a lot of evidence that the government is going to have to turn over to the respective defendants so that they can assess what the strengths and weaknesses of their cases are. A lot of times when you're dealing with a multi-defendant indictment, the government will issue protective orders in regards to the discovery, such that if I am representing one client, I may not be in a position where I can share certain information with the attorney for another client, right? Because the government doesn't want, in many respects, a lot of information to get out. And then you start dealing with issues such as witness retaliation or you know, people learning more information that can help them get an edge on the case that doesn't necessarily involve evidence from their case. So you deal with a lot of the protective orders. And also a lot of times, Lisa, you deal with out of those 10, 15, 17 defendants that may be listed on an indictment, somebody oftentimes is cooperating with the government. And a lot of times- I was gonna ask you about that. It, it, you, they're called cooperators on the streets. They're called snitches. How common is that in these, these big federal cases? It's extremely common, you know, if not always just a happenstance, right? Like this is what happens in federal prosecutions. Out of 15, 17 people, you can't say that 100% of them are comfortable with the exposure that comes with federal sentencing. Some of them may be, and they may decide, hey, I'm not going to snitch. I'm going to live by the codes of the street. But very much so often you have people who have families, who have other collateral considerations that they say, hey, I can't sit on 20 years. I can't sit on 25 years. And if the government is offering me an opportunity to give up information on all of my cohorts from the street, even though it goes against street code, 
I'm going to do it and I'm going to give up that information so that I can be in a position where I can undercut the mandatory minimum and maybe try to get myself a sentence of two, three years. Takashi 6 9 comes to mind. And then when you look at the Takashi 6 9 and the nine trade bloods case that was in, in Manhattan, the U.S. attorney in the Southern District there, he, he was actually in contact with the feds before the whole indictment thing came down. And then he was facing over 40 years and then it was reduced down to a couple of months and time served, which was basically a couple of years that he'd already been locked down. How typical is that? It's typical. I mean, to the extent that you provide substantial assistance to the federal government, they want to incentivize future cooperators having an understanding of, hey, if I work with the government, I could end up in a good situation where I'm getting a two or a three month sentence or a two or a three year sentence where otherwise I was facing upward of 40 years to life. And so the government wants that to be known. And in order to do so, they have to you know, do well on their promises. And so what you do often very much so have are these cooperators that come in and there's a race to be able to be the best niche, to give the most information more than anyone else can so that you can guarantee yourself the best deal. And when we talk about how common is it, it's pretty much regular practice. And because, and why are these cases so difficult to beat? Because they have been investigated for years on end. And so often we're talking these days, social media, we're talking, you know, with respect to a lot of rappers, lyrics that are coming out of their mouths that when, look, there's an old saying, Lisa, that you can make a federal case out of anything. But when you're actually in federal court watching that court, I'm sorry, watching that case play itself out, what you really come to find is that those years of evidence, those statements, those pictures of maybe you holding a gun or you holding the drugs that's ultimately alleged to be the you know, core of the case and the charge with which you are charged with, it becomes difficult at a certain point to say, well, that's not me. Well, clearly it is you. That's your Instagram handle. And that's a picture of you that is within the account holding the contraband that we're currently charging you with. And so at that point, really what it breaks down to is if we can't beat the charge, can we at least mitigate the sentence, right? And when we start talking about mitigating the sentence, that's when the S word starts to come in in regards to snitching. That's when, you know, some of these other, you know, plea bargains start to come in where people decide, hey, I don't even want to fight this. If I save the government the time of going to trial, maybe they'll look out for me and give me a reduced sentence. And that's how a lot of those conversations start to come into play because it is very difficult to beat these cases. Not impossible, but very difficult. Because you because you have beaten them, but you've said you've told us on Street Soldiers, Phil, you call it self-snitching in a sense with the social media, and that's named in the they they name Instagram and Facebook postings in these indictments. Explain that to us because some people think, okay, the feds are looking at social media, they're looking at music videos, and then they're making indictments off the music videos, but, or does the crime have to come first? What, what, how does that work? You don't necessarily have to put the cart before the horse or vice versa in these situations. There are times where they will simply have hip hop police, right? We are familiar with that colloquial term. And they will just be scrolling these days on social media, looking for instances of people who are coming into a lot of money, potentially tying that with lyrics from songs that deal with drugs or violence and starting to get a figure starting to figure out from maybe contacts that they have on the street, well, who's who? How is this person getting this money? What are they involved in, right? So sometimes there are investigations that just start from there and go to the top. Other times there are arenas where they actually do have evidence of a crime having been committed through information that they may have from confidential sources, from snitches, they start to zero in or target someone. And once they do that, they start going through that person's social media ad nauseum, their IG, their TikTok, their Facebook, you name it. And to the extent that they're able to start putting puzzle pieces together from that social media that connects with the theory of the case that they plan to put before the jury as to why this defendant is guilty, they'll do it. And that's where so often you have a lot of people who maybe even unbeknownst to themselves are self snitching because they never necessarily thought that they would be the target of an investigation. Right. But once you become one, now there's all this evidence that you've put out against yourself that how are you going to fight that? That's where it becomes really difficult in federal court at times. I, I can cross examine a cop. I can cross examine an FBI agent. But when my own client has essentially provided the bulk of the evidence against themselves, it gets a bit difficult. And then what advice do you have for people? Because there's, there's a certain number of, you know, the gang affiliation, people are very flagrant about that on social media with hashtags, you know, with, with different emojis that represent certain sets, all of that type of thing. 
who they're posing with, different you know hand signs for the sets or whatever. What do you think about posting all of that? How risky is that? Are they really watching all the time? It's super risky and you should presume that they're watching all the time, even if they're not, because they can retroactively go back. They can you know, file subpoenas with Facebook, with Meta, with whomever they need to, to go back and maybe even get posts that have since been deleted. You should always presume that you're being watched and act accordingly. And when you start being in a position where you are hashtagging affiliations, even if it's not a real affiliation, even if it's a situation where you're just trying to get validity for your own music career or right. authenticity in some way to be more reputable within hip hop, what then starts to happen is now you can get yourself tied up into a grander RICO case because where you may be saying like, hey, even to the extent that I sold drugs, I was just doing that personally to finance my music career. But then when the government says, but hey, every hashtag you put said the bloods or it right. said the rolling you know 60s or it said x y and z now you are a part of x y and z even if really you were just doing it for the street cred on social media right but it doesn't matter because when you're sitting before that jury and hoping that this jury that most often are not the biggest hip-hop fans particularly in federal court jurisdictions and hoping that they can put the pieces together that you're not actually a gang member you just don't want to be in that situation and then, Phil, how far back can they go? Because we saw in this superseding indictment with that Sue Surf was named in, that his his the allegations against him went back to, I think, 2019. And then the whole case, the earliest one, I think, was started in 2015. How far back can they reach in these RICO cases? Is there a statute of limitations? Well, within RICO cases, just as a predicate, a place to start, they're always looking for, has there been at least two acts of racketeering stay within the last 10 years, right? Like you can just start there. There are other arenas, however, particularly when you're talking about conspiracy law, that if you have an ongoing conspiracy, right? Let's say we started something, you know, you and I, Lisa, we made an agreement to, you know, carry on some illicit activity and like build an organization around that starting back in 2010. And every day of every year since then, we have committed acts that go toward the completion of that conspiracy, towards the profits that we were looking for that conspiracy. Even though at this point that was 12 years ago, it's been an ongoing conspiracy. We haven't gotten out of it. We haven't revoked our participation within the conspiracy. And so to that end, even though it's been that long, when did our criminal acts toward the conspiracy ever actually stop? So that wouldn't stop the statute of limitations and it would totally make anything that we did back in 2010, 2011, actionable in terms of the U.S. government coming against us for criminal culpability. Why do you feel that we're seeing so many more of these RICO cases? Is it because they've been watching? Is it because there's been a, an increase in, in alleged gang activity and criminality? What do you, and we are in a big crime wave in the United States right now everywhere. What do, you, what do you think is happening or what do you see happening? I think it's that. I think it's a lot of the media attention that, you know, is right now being focused on, you know, a lot of the, the, the crime that we have at least being reported. I think also it's just the nature of the music and like what's being inundated upon YouTube and these other outlets when we talk about the gun violence, when we talk about the drug dealing, when we talk about just the large sums of illicit money, the trafficking, all of these types of things that make up a lot of the crimes, let's just say like in the digital internet era, it also makes it a lot easier for federal authorities and for law enforcement to investigate these crimes, right? So it's actually much easier to bring a RICO, I would say for the feds now, than it was in 1991, when you had a lot of activities that literally were in the underworld. But the underworld now is displayed as much on social media as any legitimate corporate entity is advertising for you to buy their product on the internet, right? Like it's just so much easier now to see acts of criminal activity that can, you know, serve as a foundation for a RICO case than it was 30 years ago. And I think that's a large part of why we're seeing a lot more RICO cases now. Okay. And then in terms of Sue Surf, he, I was told by his manager early up before he was picked up that he had an attorney. I tried to find out the name and then I was never able to get the name of the attorney. When he was presented in federal before the judge uh, last Friday, that was October 14th, 2022, he was, uh, get, had, there was an attorney, a court appointed attorney who I guess handles, you know, appearances when some, when people don't have uh, lawyers in place, which sometimes, which is not that uncommon, I don't think in the beginning of some of these cases, but um, the judge said to him, he could not keep a court appointed attorney or be assigned one for his case because he made too much money. 
So what does that tell you? Does that mean they were already looking at his finances or does it just mean, what, what, how do you interpret that? Well, I mean, listen, when you are uh, initially presented uh, in federal court, uh, otherwise known in state court as an arraignment, right? Like when you're initially presented before a magistrate judge, there's typically a financial form that has to be filled out to determine whether or not you do actually qualify for point court appointed counsel via the Criminal Justice Act, right? And if you are reporting either income or assets that clearly are above a level wherein you would qualify as say an indigent defendant for you know, free legal assistance and free legal counsel, then of course like the government is not then going to expend that money representing you when you have the money to represent yourself. And so most likely either A, the government does have information that there are a number of either properties or assets or just a financial amount that ultimately Susurf should be retaining his own counsel or he self-reported that. Either which way at this juncture, what he's going to have to do is retain counsel. The court's gonna give him the time to do so. And then once that counsel is retained, then he can ultimately move forward with starting the process officially of defending the charges. So let me ask you this, how long can he go on being detained at Essex County Jail in the federal lockup there, still searching for a lawyer? Do they, is there a time limit? Do they say like you have to have somebody in 30 days or do you have, you know, how does that work? I mean, eventually the court is going to force the issue. Right now, most likely what's happening is either Sue Surf consented to a waiver of time uh, following the initial presentment so that he ultimately can go out and retain counsel, or even if he wouldn't have consented on a good cause application from the government or just on behalf of the magistrate themselves, they may have just excluded time that otherwise would have put the government on the hook for moving forward with prosecuting the case so that he can exercise his Sixth Amendment right to go find effective assistance of counsel to defend him on, as we've noted, what are very serious charges. Because so, so there, there, it sounds like you're saying there is a clock that there is a, cl a clock that starts at a certain point with the case, like when it, as, as it has to start move to move forward, is that right? Like once he has yeah, a- Absolutely, like once you are presented in federal court, the clock begins ticking on behalf of the federal government to move forward with either an indictment or trial. What is very customary in federal practice is that at the inception, most defendants via advice of their attorneys will, essentially ask for the clock to be stopped and the judge will grant that request because you need time. You need time to go through the discovery. You need time to figure out what's going on. A lot of people are trying to figure out how am I even here? Why did the feds just arrest me last right. night? It's gonna typically take more than 30 or 60 days, which at times is the clock that the government is held to with respect to various things that they have to do after an initial presentment. You don't want the government moving light speed ahead when you have no idea what's going on. You wanna be able to kind of catch your breath, get a grasp of what you're dealing with, and then at that point, start the process of fighting back against the government. Remember, they typically being the government have had a two, three, four year head start in knowing everything about this investigation, everything about your life. You don't know a thing. You don't know who's been cooperating. You don't know how you're here. So the courts are always gonna give defendants the time to catch themselves up to a four-year, five-year head start that the government has had since the inception of the investigation. So the next point for him, the, 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 the spokesperson for the U.S. attorney said, for the prosecutors, said he chose to be, de like, chose to be detained like he had a choice while he got an attorney. So the next step would be, and that he has not entered a plea yet. So what, what's the, let's assume once he does get an attorney, what would be the next step for him? What's the next step in this process? Well, the next logical step would be to, of course, retain the attorney and then start the process of seeing whether or not you can put together a bail package. So most likely the reason why he just consented to the detention was what's the point of making an argument to get out when you don't really have enough to show both the government and or the court that you will be able to be reasonably assured to come back to court. Of course, in this case, there is a presumption of detention because of the nature of the charges. That's just typically what comes when you're dealing with these violent offenses that are couched within a RICO conspiracy, right? There's a presumption that the person that is charged with that should be detained. So he's going to have to fight back against that presumption. It's totally rebuttable and it can be rebutted. 
but you're going to need information. You're going to need assets to show. You're going to need family members to vouch for you that they will ultimately be on the hook for a certain amount of money in the event that you flee or you go away. And you're going to have to convince the court that you're not going to be a flight risk and that you're not going to be a danger to the community. You can't just do that day one. Oftentimes in these kinds of investigations, you typically need a week or more to kind of put that information together such that when you do go to make that argument in front of the court, you're coming with something compelling as opposed to just something kind of ad hoc and just at whim on that particular day. So he's going to take his time. He's going to put his case together and then probably make his case for some sort of bond so that he can get out. But it's going to be an uphill battle for him. I'll tell you that. And, and then is there actually in federal court in a case like this, is there an actual arraignment? Like at a certain point, does he go, does he enter a plea of not yes. guilty? Yes, there will come a point where he will enter a plea of not guilty. That will most likely be once he does retain counsel because of the fact that we're already dealing with an indictment. It's not like he was arrested via a complaint and then they are moving forward to get an indictment. Here, as you noted, Lisa, the grand jury had voted to indict on these charges weeks before he was even arrested. So at this point, once he's actually retained counsel, been advised, there'll come the point where he will enter the plea. And then at that point, you're going to start the process of, in terms of the government handing over discovery, his attorney and you know him will start the process of actually going through it. And then we'll just have more developments in terms of what they decide to do. They, do they decide to start plea bargaining? Do they look at the evidence and say, hey, maybe this is one where you know we should actually go to trial? At that point, we'll see. But for right now, we're so early on in the process that they just want to make sure that he's represented. And then from there, they can start the process of the prosecution. And they always tell they tell the media because we, you know, I, I will call them a spokesperson for the U.S. attorney's office for the public information on a, on a case like this. And they'll go, the investigation is ongoing. Is it really ongoing or is that just what they say? Because, hey, stay tuned. There could be more. There could be other other things. I would say the whole of the budget for the Department of Justice is to continue ongoing investigations. I mean, there are situations, Lisa, where even following a trial, following a guilty or a not guilty verdict, there's still an ongoing investigation with respect to the same set of circumstances that led to that trial. The U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, any of these federal agencies, as you can imagine, they investigate. That's what they do. So when you get that response from the public information office, as cliche as it may be, I can tell you 100 percent as a defense attorney, they're being honest. There is an ongoing investigation. And, you know, that may be another area where whether you sue surf or you're any of those other defendants that are listed on that indictment, that's where you're going to be nervous because, you know, that investigation continues. And the, there's no requirement or is there a requirement that if you are the target of, invest, of an investigation, you don't necessarily know it. And a lot of times it seems that the defendants, they didn't realize, they thought, okay, maybe I put the streets, in some cases, maybe I put the streets, I put the streets behind me, you know, th and then now all of a sudden this caught up with me, but there, there's just, I, they didn't know they were targets. So they, I, I guess the feds would not want to show their hand, right? Exactly. And so, because when they show their hand, you have a number of things that can happen. Either a subject of an investigation decides to flee, right? And like take themselves maybe out of the country or, you know, just be in a position where it becomes very hard to uh, extradite them back to the United States. That's the number one thing that they're always worried about. And then number two is it could really put someone in a position where they either start trying to go back and retroactively clean up their act right. or they cease further criminal activity that maybe the government was hoping that that person would continue to do one or two more acts that could maybe get them to a higher level of charges that could keep them behind bars longer. But if there's now information that like clearly people are being arrested and I am actually a boss or some member of an organization that catches wind of that information, I'm going to shut everything down. Of course, the government doesn't want that happening. So that's a lot of times why they continue these investigations in silent. It's why you deal with a lot of these sealed indictments because they just don't want to signal, show their hand. And then you have people that are subject to these investigations making decisions based upon that. All right, well, Phil, thank you so much for breaking this all down for us. Um, I'm sure we'll be coming back to you as we always do as the, case, as the case proceeds. And thank you so much for being our legal commentator on Street Soldiers on Fox 5 and Fox Soul and Hot 97 and also Fox 5 News. So thank you so much for being with us and breaking this all down. We appreciate it. Lisa, it's always a pleasure. And thank you for joining us. Until next time.